So here we have the character events function, which controls the movement of the playable character. An event function has access to four different parameters, which are local variables to the function. These are an event object, which draws information about the event that just happened in the game. This can be a key press on the keyboard or a mouse click as two examples. Then we have the X and Y location where this event happened. If we were to click somewhere with the mouse, for example, then the X and Y coordinates would be where the click happened. The SD parameter holds the amount of seconds that have passed since the sprite manager was first shown in the game. As soon as the screen it is in is shown to the player, then it will start counting the seconds. To detect different events in the game, we compare the event object to the event we want to detect. For this, we create an if statement and check if the event type is equal to a key down event. That's because we want to know if either the left or right arrow key was pressed down by the player. To do that, we need to access the PyGame module inside of RenPy and then the name of the event. We also need to know if the countdown timer has finished in order for the player to be able to move the character. So as long as the countdown timer is equal to zero and the event is a key down event, we can continue. The rules of this minigame is that the player must press either the left or right arrow key, release it, and then press the opposite key. We don't want to allow both buttons to be mashed at the same time, as that will make the game too easy. For that to work properly in the game, we need to know which buttons are pressed at the same time. For that, we will use a function available to the Pygame key module called getPressed. This will retrieve a sequence object with all the different keys available on the keyboard, which we will store inside of a local variable to this function, that I've called keys pressed. The keys that are being pressed down will have the value true in the sequence, while all the other keys will have the value false. Now that we have that, we can check with if statements if the left or right key is being pressed down. This is done with an if and elif statement to make sure only one can be true at a time. To check if the left key is pressed down, we access the sequence and grab the item from it residing at the index number of k left. The value of the item grabbed will be either true or false if the key is pressed down or not. So if this is true, then we're going to set the playStartMove variable to true, which I briefly talked about earlier. Whenever this variable is set to true, then that means we no longer need to show the frame that shows the explanation of how to play the game to the player. We also have two new variables in this function called left key pressed as well as right key pressed. These variables we set to true whenever either the left or right key has been pressed. These are also global variables defined amongst the other variables we have. So in this first if statement, we set the left key pressed variable to true. In the next if statement, we check if the key pressed is instead the right key. That is done the same way as the other if statement, but we simply swap k left for k right. Then we set the place.move variable to true and the right key press variable to true as well. So now when the player presses the left arrow key, for example, this function will run and the variable left key pressed will be set to true. Then if the player presses the right arrow key, the function will run again and the right key pressed variable will also be set to true. Now if both of these variables have been set to true, then the selected character should move one step to the right. To check this, we create another if statement and compare if the variables have the value true. Inside here, we can go ahead and set the variables to false now because we need to do another check the next time the player presses one of the keys. Next, we need to check which character it is that we need to move. For that, we compare the selected character variable to the available characters that we have. Then we call the custom function that I've named character move and specify the character sprite that should be moved. Make sure that you also declare the global variables that we change the values of inside this function as globals at the top of the function to make sure that this works properly. So now let's have a look at the character move function. In this function, we're going to move the character sprite towards the right on the x-axis until it has reached the x-coordinate of the goal. For that, we first check if the x-position of the character is less than the goal x post variable's value. If it is, then we can move the character to the right according to the variable called player choice speed that we had a look at earlier. This variable's value is set to 20, meaning the character will move 20 pixels to the right when we add this value to its current position. The player indicator needs to move with the character as well, so we need to update the selected character post list with the new character coordinates. In order for the value change of this variable to take place inside the game as soon as it happens, we are also going to need to restart the interaction. Otherwise, the player indicator won't move at all until something causes a new interaction. Then we also have an else statement here, which will run if the if statement is evaluated to false. This would mean the character has now reached the goal's x position.
In this case, we're going to set a variable called goal reached to true. This variable will be checked in the update function that moves the emphases to make sure they stop moving once the goal has been reached, and we'll have a look at that soon. We also set another global variable called who won to be equal to the character sprite that reached the goal. This variable is defined with the initial value of none. Once those two things have been done, we show a game over screen and then restart the interaction. Let's have a look at the game over screen before we have a look at the update function which moves the emphases. So here we have the game over screen that shows up when the playable character or an NPC have reached a goal. It contains a frame with a transparent black background color with another frame inside it. Inside that, we have a title text that says game over, then a few if and elif statements that checks which character won so we can tell the player if it was them or an NPC. If the who won variable is equal to the character won sprite, and if the selected character is character won, then we have a text as variable that says you won. But if it isn't the selected character, we instead say the character won won. Then we do the same check for the other scenarios and add text as variables accordingly. At the bottom of the second frame, we also have a text button that allows the player to play again. The action for this runs a function that resets the game so it can be played from the beginning. Now let's have a look at the update function of the sprite manager that moves the emphases, and then after that we'll have a look at this reset function as the last thing. So here we have the update function named mpc movement. This function takes one parameter called st which holds the amount of seconds since the sprite manager was first shown in the game. In here we're going to move the mpc characters according to their speed. This will work as this function runs every millisecond according to the value we use together with the return statement. If the function returns 1.0 instead then it would run every second. If we supply none then the function would only run once. The first thing we check here is if the goal has not been reached yet and if the countdown timer is zero, because if that is true then we want to keep moving the emphases towards the goal. Here we also need to check which the selected character is so we can make sure that we only move all of the other ones. If it happens to be the first one then we move character 2 and 3. To move them we call another function called mpc move and supply it with the sprite that represents the character to move. And since we need to move two of them we call the function two times. We do the same checks with two other if statements by checking if the selected character is 2 or 3 and then move the other characters accordingly. As long as the goal hasn't been reached yet and the countdown timer is 0, we want to keep moving the emphases, so we have to return the value 0 so this update function will keep running every millisecond. If the countdown timer happens to not have finished yet, we also need to return 0 to keep the function running so that once it's completed, the emphases and the characters can immediately start moving. So here we have an elif statement that checks if it's not zero, then we simply return zero. The last else statement returns none if none of the if or elif statements above are true anymore. That would mean that the goal has been reached and we no longer need to keep running the update function. And that's all the ways to this function. Now let's move on to the last function, which is the reset function that runs when the player clicks on the play again button in the game over screen. This function is pretty simple in that we mainly just need to reset many of the global variables we have back to their initial values as well as reposition the characters back to their starting point. For the variables we just need to copy the initial values we have above the start label where we define them. For the character positions we only need to reset the x coordinates because that's the only value that have changed during the game. Here we refer to the character start x pose variable that contains the starting x coordinate for the characters. After all necessary resetting have been done we can now hide the game over as well as the minigame screen and then show the character selection menu. And that's all the code that we need to make this minigame work. Now if we launch the game to see how it works like, we can see that the first thing we get is the menu screen. Here we can see that the images for the image buttons changes when we hover over them as well as when we click on one of them to select one. Then after we have selected a character and pressed on the start button, the minigame will start. Here we can now see the countdown happening with the timer we created and once it's completed, the racing will begin. Now we can also see the explanation of how to play the game show up, and as soon as I press the right or left arrow key, it will disappear as the players.move variable has been set to true. We can see that the NPCs are moving at different speeds, and if I now alternate between the left and right arrow keys, the character I selected should also start to move. 
Once both the left and right arrow keys have been pressed, the character moves 20 pixels to the right towards the goal. Now as I'm not fast enough, one of the NPC characters won, and the message shown on the screen tells us it was character 2. That's because their speed is faster than character 3, according to the setup function. If we choose to play again, then the minigame is reset, and the characters return to their starting positions. This time, I'll try to be quicker and get to the goal before the NPCs by pressing on the arrow keys a bit faster. We have to remember to alternate between the keys for it to work as well, as mashing them at the same time won't work. This time, we can see I made it before the NPCs, and the message on the screen says I won. As a bonus, I thought I could show you how to use an animated image for a character instead of a still image, as I know that some of you are going to be wondering about that. For that, we can simply create an image ADL block and define the animation like you normally would. In this example, I made an image ADL block for the first character and added three different images that makes up the animation. Then to add it to the sprite, you would simply refer to the name of this image block rather than a file name. Then you would just need to do the same thing for the other characters as well. For those of you who are a patron in the script today or higher, can download the complete script, and the link to that is in the description box below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.